athletics, some, um, some cycling, so a broad range of just some fantastic athletes. All right, so our action plan, so what we're going to cover tonight, um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start off um, just beginning with body image. And then from there, we're just going to kind of move into the sport body and then how a sport body and our body image can actually um, lead us to or develop into disordered eating and that this disordered eating can progress into an eating disorder. And then for each one of us, what are some of the warning signs that we can look for? So what can we look or watch for within the athletes or just any person that we deal with on a regular basis? And then once you do recognize those warning signs, uh, what can we do? So that's kind of where we'll finish off is some action points of what we can do if we think that we have an athlete that has body image or disorder eating or eating disorders. Um, yeah, and then we can just discuss between ourselves as well what you've Think that we can do or what you've done in the past. So the first part that we're going to step into, like I mentioned, is just defining what body image is. So body image is the subjective personal interpretation of an individual's body and that includes both their cognitive, their emotional, and their behavioral dimensions. So it's kind of like what you believe about your own appearance just based on memories or assumptions. It's kind of how you feel about your body and including your height and your shape, your hair color. And it's, it's defined by your own thoughts and perceptions and just your attitude. It's what you see when you look in the mirror. Just like the image on the right shows, this is, always stands out so much to me, is just this warning sign that reflections in the mirror may be distorted by socially constructed ideas of beauty. And for for many of us and for many athletes, this is just so true that our body image is, is distorted or changed and not based off of the true facts. So what is a positive body image? So a positive body image is a clear, true perception of your shape. You're seeing the various different parts of your body as they really are. So it's a body positivity or a body satisfaction, which inv involves feelings of comfort, confidence in your body, you're just accepting your natural body shape and size and recognizing that physical appearance has a lot, very little to do with your character or the value of you as a person. But on the opposite side of that spectrum, what is a negative body image? So this involves more of a, your distorted view or perception of your own shape or your, your physical ability or your mental ability. So it's a negative body image or body dissatisfaction that involves feelings of shame, anxiety, self-consciousness. And people who experience high levels of body dissatisfaction feel that their bodies are flawed in some way in comparison to everyone else. That's a big component. It's that comparison to other people, seeing that you're more flawed. And you're more likely, people who with body dissatisfaction, to suffer from feelings of depression, isolation, have low self-esteem, and, and then therefore some eating disorders as well. And something that we'll discover later and we'll, we'll swing back around to is the fact that there is no single cause for an eating disorder, but research does indicate that body dissatisfaction is the best known contributor to the development of some of your key eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia. So let's move on just to talk a little bit more about body dissatisfaction, so that part of having a, a negative body image. So this is a mismatch between your own ideas of your body or your athlete's own ideas of their, about their body and comparing it to what they perceive as the ideal, so what they perceive as the optimum or the healthy body or the perfect body. And it's often associated with a, a desire or a drive to be thin and for dieting and is associated with disordered eating patterns and then the, the progression and the development of the eating disorder. So when, as each one of you deals with athletes on a regular basis, uh, they're, as you are already aware, I'm sure they're just their own special population. I mean, even more so when it comes to um, body image and disordered eating and eating disorders. So this is a pretty cool 
uh, fact that's come out of some research is that athletes can be really happy and content with their bodies in a social setting. So when they're out and about in regular life, they can be happy with their bodies and satisfied with their, like have a positive body image. But when they step into their sporting environment, that can change and they're dissatisfied with their bodies. So the same athlete that's happy and content with their body in their regular day-to-day -day life can be dissatisfied when they think about their bodies in their, their sporting environment. So it's quite a, an amazing thing to think about. And then this, this quote just on the right-hand side really drove it home for me is that there is a lot less pressure when I allow myself to be me than when I feel forced to fit into an athletic ideal. So if we're going to go from there and we're going to actually think about some of our own ideas or associations that we have between different body shapes. So as you can see on the screen, we have um, two silhouettes, one on the right and one on the left. And this is just a moment for each one of us just to reflect at each one of these, like kind of each line of descriptor and which silhouette would you associate each one of these descriptors with? So if you think about unhealthy eating, do you associate that more so with the silhouette on the left or more the silhouette on the right? If you think of someone who's an athlete or a competitive swimmer, again, which silhouette do you automatically go to? And this is an exercise not to, if we think, just to go off your basic instinct and what you first think when you try to associate those words with one of the, one of the silhouettes. Uh, so the next one is, who do you associate as being driven? Or which one would you consider more as socially awkward? And then which one would you consider more of a public motivator? And just if you're honest with yourself, and where many people, uh, you may have noticed some habits or tendencies to like sway positive and negative descriptors to either one of those different silhouettes and so just keep that in mind and think about some of your own ideas that have been kind of ingrained into each one of us about who or what shapes we kind of associate positive and negative attributes with and then this is where we get into the sport body so this is kind of tiny but you can see this is just I'm sure many of you have seen this before but just a picture of different body shapes, different sports body shapes. Um, so these are all incredible athletes and they all do different sports, but it's pretty cool and pretty amazing just to see how many different body shapes. And some of them are more like silhouette on the left, some of them are more like silhouette on the right, but these are all high level, high, high performing athletes and they're phenomenal at what they do. But they are totally different body shapes. And I know if each one of us thinks, um, if you ever think of, we all tend to have, like if you think of a, a rugby player, do you have a specific body shape that comes to mind? Or if you think of a gymnastic athlete, is there a specific kind of body shape that you think goes towards one or the other? So that's just kind of challenging some of our own, as coaches or people who deal with athletes on a regular basis, um, just challenging some of our own thought processes on definitions of what body shape should be and then also respecting the fact that this is something that our athletes or the athletes deal with on a daily basis too is their own assumptions of their own body shapes and body images and just to play into that a little bit here we are just going to watch a quick little youtube um on rosie oh, i cut off the feed but she was a canadian women's trampoline gold medalist she has some pretty cool things to say so we're just going to watch that for a second So, Melissa, it's Natasha. So, what you'll have to do is just um, you can stop sharing this and share your full screen. Do you have it up on your own screen? No, but I can do that in like two seconds for sure. Yep. So, I'll stop sharing the screen for you and then go to um, share your screen. We'll see your whole screen and then we can watch it.
How are you doing there? Just trying to share my screen. There we go. Mm. Yeah, so on your Adobe Connect screen, you're just going to click the little down button. All right, so once you guys have a chance to watch that, um, it's just pretty cool. Rosie's a pretty amazing athlete, and she has some very cool things to say about body image and just accepting your own strength as an athlete, independent of your body shape. All right, so we will go on. So these are just some facts out, um, keeping it more research-based, just on the prevalence of body image issues, disorder eating, and eating disorders within um, society. And then we also break it down in within athletes. Um, so I'm sure you'll realize, but some of these statistics are pretty staggering. Um, so 40 to 60 percent of elementary school girls, so aged 6 to 12 are concerned about their weight or about being too fat, so a huge percentage. 50% um, of fourth grade girls, so just grade or age nine, have dieted already, and 89% have dieted by the age of 17. Um, the typical age to begin having an ED, so which is an eating disorder, is between the age of 14 to 25, so peak ages for an athlete. Um, and it, up to 15% of young women, so quite a few, like just women in general, young women have disorder eating. And then once we bring it back to athletes, up to 30% of athletes are experiencing subclinical eating disorder symptom, symptoms. So, and 3% of referee sports versus 13% in judge sports. So just to bring the fact that and we'll, we'll find that in points later that just judge sports tend to have more prevalence of eating disorder or disorder eating. So your leanest focused sport athletes have higher rates of disorder eating and eating disorders compared to athletes from sports that don't have body weight, body shape requirements. And so these statistics are quite massive. So 46.7% of athletes from a leanest focused sport versus the Still very high, 19.8% for other athletes that are not within the leanest focus sport. And just some more facts, just because there's a lot out there, and just to really drive home the point. Um, so for individuals, individuals like many of you, so coaches, 91% um, of coaches believed within this research paper that they did this research um, that they have encountered an athlete with an eating disorder. And up to 94% of elite athletes in weight sensitive sports acknowledge that they have used um, extreme dieting restriction or weight control measures to meet or maintain some of the target weight goals that they have within, within their weight sensitive sports. And then again, like your female, female athletes in your more creative sports have found um, to be at the highest risk for eating disorders. So there's estimates estimate up to 62%, so a massive amount, a huge percentage of female. And female athletes are more likely to use compulsive dieting for exercise and pathological weight loss methods. So things like your laxatives, your diet pills, your self-induced vomiting and fasting in hopes that this will help them to improve their, their physical condition and their sporting performance. And then the last fact is just that more young female athletes report improvement of appearance, so that it's more important that they're improving their appearance rather than actual improvement of their performance as for a reason why they're dieting. So just some crazy, crazy facts just to show us just how, how prevalent this is within society and within even more so within athletes. So how do we get from, how does the continuum work? So how do we go from eating normally into disorder eating and then into a, a, clini or a clinical version of an eating disorder? So as you see on your left-hand side, normal eating is what's that positive body image and that's that feeling that's comfortable with being okay. As you slide down the scale a little bit more to the right, that's when we start to see more of that 
body feel satisfaction. A little bit more focus on body weight or shape and then that's when we start to see the anxiety. And then as we get in more of the disordered eating, um, we start to see that rigid eating or exercise. I'm sure uh, each one of us know someone or have seen people who have these pretty strict, rigid rules about eating and or exercise. And that's what you can get into is binge eating and even where they start to define their day as whether if it was good or bad based off of their eating and their exercise that they did that day. And then once it gets to an even more clinical, so just continuing down with the continuum, <laughs> off to the right into the eating disorder, that's when life is dominated by thoughts of weight and shape and food. And there's actual like clinical diagnosis that goes along with um, having a definition of an eating disorder. And so that's where the whole the whole team around the athlete comes in, comes in together and works on that diagnosis and management of it. So what's to see a disordered eating? So we went from normal eating and then we start to get into like more worry about weight and losing our relationship with food and starting to create some of the, these barriers or restrictions on um, food. So this is when we get into disordered eating. So it refers to when an athlete's attitudes about food, weight, and body size lead to rigid to very rigid eating and exercise habits. And this is different from when an athlete is just paying attention to their nutrition and their health, which we know is a key part that every athlete needs to focus on, nutrition and health. It's very important just to their sport and just with their performance. But this is, so this is beyond this, which is the more restrictive eating and exercise habits. And a disorder eating can be, it can be very harmful to an athlete's physical and emotional well-being. It can have a negative impact on their performance. And even though it may just begin as a way to lose a few pounds or gain some muscle or get into shape, it can just quickly grow into something that's out of control and, and or become an obsession. And that's when it turns into an eating disorder. So just to familiarize ourselves, because the list of definitions or different styles of eating disorders continues to grow. Um, the first two are two that I'm sure most of you have heard of before, so your anorexia. So that's just an extreme restriction from food, overwhelming fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, and of course that's distorted body image. And then your binge eating, another one that most of us have probably heard of, is just acts of binging followed by purging, sometimes abusing laxatives or diuretics, and or engaging in excessive exercise and food restriction. And then as we go down the line, this is when they get to be maybe a little lesser known. So there's the avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. So this is the eating or feeding disturbance. So a lack of interest in eating or food. Uh, avoidance based on like sensory characteristics. So the texture, the feel of the food. Concern about aversion, consequences of eating. So, and it's often manifested as a failure to meet your nutritional or, or their energy needs. And you'll see like weight loss, um, failure to grow in children, like significant weight deficiencies, sometimes even leading to the dependence on enteral or oral nutritional supplementation. And then the next one is like rheumatization disorder. So this is one that's not super well known, but it's, the regular regurgitation of food that occurs at least once a month. Um, so it's like rechewing or re swallowing or spitting out food. And often, like, not that it's something that where they're trying to make an effort or they're stressed or upset, but just doing this um, rechewing or re swallowing or, um, or spitting their food out after chewing it for a while. And then there's pika, which um, this is an eating disorder where you eat items that are not typically thought of as food and really don't contain any significant nutritional value. So that could be like hair or dirt, um, paint chips. I've heard many times of um, paper or towels, so just things that are not typically thought of as food and they have no nutritional value for it. And the anthorexia, which is in one of the newer ones, has come out with the whole clean eating movement, or has become more prevalent with the whole clean eating movement. So this is when 
and where that queen leaves the room and is taken to an extreme, so it becomes an obsession with proper or healthy eating. Uh, and then there's just a couple other ones, um, like your atypical anorexia, some purging disorder, and night eating syndrome. So as you can see, there's eating disorders are quite detailed, and there's many different ones, and they have different attributes, and they can be quite unique. So why do we why do we care so much? Not only just because of body image and the mental space, but so, and most of these eating disorders are body image. They're cutting back on the nutrition that the athletes are taking in. So why is this so important? So that's kind of where something called uh, REDS as an acronym or relative energy deficiency comes into play. So in the last however many years, well, it initially started out as the female triad. So that's when the idea that not enough energy again for women is that not enough energy affects your menstrual function and bone health. And that was the initial thought. But now it's developed this research has developed into something so much more where now it's a relative energy deficiency in sports. So it's not just the female triad, it still is, but it's also so it's not just menstrual function and bone health, but they've also realized so an athlete's not taking in enough energy, so they're deficient. It's also affecting their endocrine, their metabolic, their growth and de development, cardiovascular, their gastrointestinal, and their immune. So it's just an, it's an impairment of physiological functioning is caused by relative energy deficiency, so consistently not taking in enough food, but from which is often because of eating disorders or disordered eating. It impairs the metabolic rate, the menstrual function, the bone health, immunity, protein synthesis, and cardiovascular health. So pretty big things, not only just in the athlete as a human being, but in their performance as well. So in the red, this is something um, that a lot of people don't realize and athletes don't realize, is that an energy deficiency, so if someone is consuming or an elite athlete is consuming less, just like 300 calories less than what their body needs to perform at the level that they, they need it to be, it can actually lead to, or is associated with a higher body fat percentage, which with body images and disordered eating, eating disorders often that's what they're fighting against is that losing weight, looking to lose weight and cut weight. So they're cutting in all this, these calories, but then it's also leading higher body fat, fat percentage, so they're um, kind of working against themselves. It's because their body has this um, pretty interesting like adaptive response to energy deficiency where it almost goes in, some people call this starvation mode, and it just causes your metabolism to decrease and your fat storage to increase. Their bodies are pretty cool, fine-tuned machines that always fight to survive. So relative Energy deficiency is a big thing that's been up and uh, been within the sporting industry as we become more and more aware how much that impacts um, our athletes. So if they're not consuming enough on a regular basis, often through like sort of eating and eating disorder, and this isn't just from females. Like so, it began as a female triad, um, but it's been brought in so much more as we've come to realize that. Um, Male athletes experience it as well, and so much, like as we do more and more research and it comes out more and more, we realize that male percentage of the experiences are extremely high as well, particularly in things like cyclists, rowers, runners, and any of those, again, like weight-based sport categories. But it's that, that desire to try and make weight often, just not continuing to consume enough energy can be all a huge change in that and that they're putting on themselves. So this is just a screen. Actually super amazing, but there are a bunch of different screens and tools and questionnaires that have come out based off of reds and um, energy deficiency and trying to determine whether or not athletes are within this state of not getting enough energy. Um, there's numerous different ones, like these 
Deep Q and other ones like there. Um, there's so many, but none of them have been tested, or none of none of them are being used consistently across the board. So it's still a work in progress trying to figure out which one's the best, which is the most tested, and what give us the best answers to define whether or not an athlete is actually performing within that relative energy deficiency. So what are some of the warning signs that, that you as coaches or anyone else dealing with athletes that you can look for? Um, so energy deficiency or eating disorder, you can look for, for females particularly, um, altered pe periods or absent or irregular. And this gets a bit tricky as a lot of females are on birth control and that affects their periods. So that one can be a bit hard since sometimes it's not there for those reasons. Uh, but you can look for fatigue and tiredness. Sleeping difficulties can be associated with an energy deficiency. Um, stress fractures, you know, because not eating enough on a consistent basis is, um, has big impact on bone. Um, so reoccurrent and frequent injuries. So if you have an athlete that continuously is getting injured, that's a, a red flag or maybe something that you want to watch a little bit. So having cold hands and feet. That could be another another sign. Or if you just watch an athlete and you're just noticing that they're eating less and maybe for the purpose of trying to achieve a better performance. So that would be like maybe starting to watch, see if there's disorder eating or eating disorder there. And then you just notice a pervasive desire to be thin. So hmm. This would be where your open lines of communication with your athletes would come in. So just with talking to them and, and watching and noticing if that starts to become a, a drive among your athletes. And then something that no athlete wants to see or have happen, but energy deficiency or not taking enough food in can lead to reduced athletic performance. So the very thing that they're doing in hopes to achieve a better performance can actually be working against them because they are eating under what their body needs. So some other symptoms of disorder eating or eating disorder can be like headaches or constipation. So again, remember, not eating enough, like having a relative energy deficiency can have lots of gastrointestinal impacts. So that constipation, that diarrhea, um, breathing problems, getting dizzy or sadness or tiredness, all these things can kind of can be warning signs to you that Maybe just pay a little bit more attention to these athletes and just check up on them a little bit more to make sure that we're aware. But obviously, within our watching and looking for warning signs, there's lots of challenges to identifying a disorder eating or eating disorder. So first of all, a big one obviously is our kind of some of our stereotypes of what each sport of body should look like. So what should, like I mentioned before, a gymnast look like, or what does a roller look like? What does a cyclist look like? What does a rugby player look like? What does a football player look like? So all of these different sports tend to have like stereotypes um, or typical body shapes that you see with these athletes. So just that's a challenge. It can make it hard to identify. Um, and then even our own uh, beliefs and experiences can make it challenging to identify disorder eating or eating disorder. And then a lack of resources. So just like I mentioned, uh, with the relative energy deficiency in sport, there are some tools out there to help you assess relative energy deficiency. Like I already mentioned a little further down this page, like Leaf MQ, Red's Cat, the DSMV. But again, these are all still tools that are be work being worked on that are being used across the board by all professionals haven't been something yet that's been designated as like the best tool. Um, and then good athlete traits. So having an athlete that's, you know, someone that you would define as just like a good athlete and having that counter vision towards or helping us like not notice some of these disorder eating disorder traits. And then success and performance. Of course, this is a massive part for each and every coach and athlete is that drive and that desire to succeed in performance. So that's a big one. If there's success in performance, that can 
gosh, I'm, you know, make it harder to recognize that disorder eating eating disorder or to do it in your body if you do, if your athlete is still continuously performing and having success at those moments. Because there is that, that desire to win or to win at all costs. So maybe either an athlete would rather win even if they know that they're not consuming enough energy, they don't care because it's more important to win than all the other consequences of not eating enough food. So there's lots of different challenges to identifying and to dealing with disorder eating or eating disorder. There's just some more information from some research that's been done um, just from a university athletic area. So university athletic Departments often struggle with caring for athletes who participate in unhealthy eating and exercise practices, especially when these athletes refuse to seek help due to fear, embarrassment, or a lack of readiness to change. So, again, it's that awareness that um, sometimes athletes are very aware, are often very aware of like the, what they're doing and and where they're at in their in their tr nutrition and what they're eating, but they're it's it's oftentimes fear and embarrassment or just again that lack of readiness to change, especially if they're having success or they think this is what is going to help them have success in their sport. Here are some truths just about eating disorders that I thought we I'd throw in there just because sometimes there's misconceptions and different ideas about it so. One of the big ones is that you just can't tell by looking at someone if they have an eating disorder. Um, it doesn't always have to be someone who's super, super skinny, thick, thin, um, and the families are not to blame. And the third one is a key one is that, that we need to remember is that it's not a choice, but it's, an, it's a mental illness. So just keep that in mind anytime we're thinking about someone we may think has an eating disorder or disorder eating. And then it can affect all people of age, people of all ages, gender, sexual orientation, race, and socioeconomic status. And that even though genes do play a role, which they've found that genes play a role in eating disorders, but environment also influences it. So there's a sporting environment, home environment, any part of their environment influences the development of this eating disorder. But the positive part of it is that recovery Full recovery is possible. So how do we, what are the steps now that we can do? What can you do as coaches or as anyone that's around athletes to help get to this point where this beautiful last point that full recovery is possible? So here are just some pointers. So one thing that you can do, I've mentioned a couple different times, is just to look at your own beliefs. So what are your thoughts? What are some of your own deeply embedded re beliefs that, you know, oftentimes we don't even realize that we have? So just spending some time introspective and looking at some of your own beliefs. And then getting to facts. So just kind of like this, coming to this webinar tonight is just getting some facts on body image and disorder eating and eating disorders and how that fits in life in this athletic world. And then Another big thing that we can do is respect natural body sizes and their limitations. So the fact that there are many different body sizes and each one have like strengths and weaknesses. And then each one of us can definitely model our own positive approach to food. And then I really think that this one is important, but having, having open communication, this is so key to like dealing with or being around your athletes is just to have these open lines of communication so that they can come and just be honest and with you and you with them and hopefully work towards having yeah an open communication if they are struggling with an eating disorder and then promoting a positive body self-esteem um, not just like with yourself and then letting the athletes see that so this is will help and then helping athletes to feel good about themselves and develop a positive concept of who they are. And a beautiful one point that's brought up of what you can do is invite your athletes to be assertive and allowing them, and this is kind of through the open communication, to be assertive and to express all their feelings and their values and their needs. 
into sport. So almost creating a safe space um, for a policy, whether it's safe space for openness and communication. So it's all about you being, or us being role models and inspiring balances and using the resources that we have. So just to reiterate, one of the facts is just how important our own beliefs and our own thoughts of our own our own selves. So having a positive role model includes accepting your own body and having a healthy relationship or a healthy way of eating uh, with food and with being active. So being that role model is really displaying it to our athletes from that perspective. And making this includes avoiding making comments about your own appearance. So remember that positive role model, accepting your own body. So staying away from comments on your own appearance or the appearance of others. Um, yeah, just these are some great things that we can do to just really help with a, create a positive body image and open up the lines around the sort of disorders. So how do we continue to like, here's some more ideas on how to promote a, a positive body image. So just like I've been mentioning, it's monitoring your own beliefs, language around food and body and shape, having your own healthy relationship with food and a healthy emotional control around food, affirming yourself and others around you, really promoting positive body related talk. And then informing yourself as someone that's around them on a regular basis um, about fueling strategies from evidence-based sources. So when we're talking about nutrition and what you need for their body as athletes, really making sure that you delve into evidence-based sources, whether from your own research or like tapping into the team that you have around you, whether it's dietitians or any of the other support staff that you have. And then really try and stay away from or condone negative body body related language from your athletes. So if you hear it, just really trying to um, discredit or disallow that some of that negative uh, body talk from your athletes. And then just observe, just watch your athletes or those you're around for, for patterns and signs and symptoms of being in an energy deficiency. And then having a body related conversation with your athlete. Once you have thought why you're having what you hope to achieve and have a nutrition psychology professional team working with you. So if any time that we think about having a related body related conversation with our athletes, we really want to make sure that we step back and think about why we're having this conversation and really what we hope to achieve. So being very sensitive and listening to athletes and why we're talking about approaching this body related conversation in the first place. And then also bringing someone else there with you, whether it's from nutrition or psychology. And then just really striving to understand your athletes or strive to understand your athletes' understanding about fuel. So what are they thinking? Why are their thoughts the way they are? What, where are they at exactly in their knowledge around what their body needs to fuel for their sport performance? And just really listen to your athletes and validate Just to build on some of those points maybe a little bit more, we just really want to create and support a safe and positive training environment. So you can just see this and it's on a link here, but bodysense.ca. I've got a bunch of tools at the end of this webinar as well to just really link to what we use in the future. Um, but this is a great site where you can look for ways to start conversations for promoting a healthy body image with your athletes. And they're just a little acronym because who doesn't love those? Uh, so watch W, watch for signs and symptoms. A, ask questions and assess the risk. Um, L, listen without judgment. K is keep safe, so all the support safe. Keep your area safe. And S is have that support with a qualified nutrition professional and a clinical psychologist. Whenever we're talking. So how do we, how do we approach the athletes that we think may be that has a disorder eating or eating? Again, just really driving home this point. Um, it's just choosing if it's not you that's going to 
approach the athlete, choose someone with, who has built up trust and relationship with the athlete. When you do, the athlete really views the focus on I statement. Um, so things like, I'm concerned about you because you refuse to eat breakfast or lunch. I feel afraid when I hear you vomit. So it's just really staying away from those kind of accusing you statements where you have to eat breakfast, you're out of control. And then just to build on that a little more, stick to the I statement, you know, but also avoid the solutions. Like if you just, if you would just stop, everything would be okay. So those are like things that I could think of that you can do for solutions. And then approach the athlete from something in private. Maybe this is something that is a private matter, and not with the rest of the team hanging around. And again, yes, just avoid those simple solutions. And one key thing is for sure to avoid discussing implications for sport. So just keep it a step or back from how this can affect impact performance in the sport. Just something much more. And again, encourage that multidisciplinary help. Because um, that's why your whole team is there, because we're all there to help. Every person has experiences and knowledge that we can bring. And again, we suspect your athlete potentially has a disorder that you can make sure to do a follow-up after you have approached them. All right, so here are some tools that I've just put on the webinar so you guys can access them later. A phenomenal tool, the trainer, Coach and Trainer Toolkit. That is an amazing tool for, for coaches. It's all around eating disorders and body image. Um, there's a very cool eating and body image self-check that you can do just with that hyperlink. It just goes through a test and um, something interesting to get athletes to do too. Just, just the answers to your questions that can show you if you're leaning towards disorder eating or not. Um, this eating disorder screening tool, another one. There's a weight bias implicit test. Um, just helping to expose some of our own weight bias. And then your sports and, e and eating disorders through Project No. And then some more websites just to show you some of the warning terms and symptoms. And a bunch of references. So yeah, that's all I have. Nice job. Thank you so much, Melissa. So I just posted in the chat box as well that um, Melissa, I'll circulate your slides to everyone tomorrow uh, so that they can get a copy because those are some really great tools and stuff at the end. Yeah, so that was really helpful and it was very interesting. So thank you. So I want to open it up um, to everyone online. If you have any questions, type them away. If you have a longer question and you'd like access to your mute, uh, your, <laughs> your mic, just say so and I can do that. Or if you're comfortable typing, type away. I found that really interesting, Melissa, so thank you very much for joining us tonight and chatting through this great topic.